Right, well, good morning. Um, can you hear me at the back? Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> right, okay. I tell my students, and I've just come from a field course, when you're giving a presentation, never make an apology. Um, but I'm going to break this rule and make an apology. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background uh, to what's going on, so you'll understand a bit later on uh, how the uh, lecture goes. Because I've just spent a month in Brazil setting a brand new B uh, project up there. Everything very well, went very well. But unfortunately, I had to fly back into England to go straight to the Lake District to, to run a field course for a week um, with the students, which is, we managed to do that. And then I got straight on the train from the field course to come down to National Honey Show to give this talk, which was getting it very tight and fine, but it was going to work. And then I was just putting the finished touches to the talk, which I'd sorted out in Brazil, and then my computer went black, and it died completely. I've tried to rescue what I could. Uh, the choices were to turn around and go back to Sheffield and try and pick up some old material. Uh, I wasn't going to get time to get to here. So I thought, right, massive panic attack. I thought I'd just come here and try and wing it. Um, <laughs> dug around in my old bag because I'm carrying everything from Brazil and everywhere else because I've not really been home yet. I'll get home after this. Um, and I found an old memory stick and I've dug out an old, uh, an old talk which I haven't practiced, I haven't been through, but I know it's on hornets. And luckily in the title it says The Basic Life of Hornets and Wasps, which it is going to be very basic. Um, but then I realised this when I was um, sleeping during the evening, well, actually in the morning, trying to get out of bed, is that most beekeepers know a huge amount about bees. And every time we talk to bees, we usually have to really ramp it up to a very high level. We're talking about viruses and to, to give you something new. Um, but then when you talk to them about something like wasps, actually they're not often that clear. They've got an inkling but they're not completely clear. And then I suddenly realised, I will actually know about both, but I know nothing about termites, because there's a lot of termites out in Brazil, and I know absolutely nothing. So I thought, actually, it's not a bad time to go through and fit in, and I think it's a really good idea by Simon to ask us to do this. And I know you'll all think this is about the Asian hornet. Well, actually, even the original talk, there was just a little bit about the Asian hornet at the end. Um, so here we go. So this, this is not being done on the train, done on a plane. This is being done now, live. <laughs> we'll just see how it goes, see how the old memory goes. So anyway, so if I remember, I work on dangerous things. This is a dangerous thing. <laughs> a mammal with a bazooka. Um, yeah, the first few introductory slides, this talk was, was designed for school children to get them interested in science. And... Uh, it's actually quite a good laugh. So we were trying to explain that this is my friend. I'm taking the photograph. He's actually a, a scientist. We tried to get him to guess what he's studying uh, up on the hills. And eventually it's plants. He, he looks at plants in extreme environments. And we ask him why there's no plants on, well, you know, why it's a great place for, place for plants on such an environment. And, you know, there's no rabbits or cows live up there. Okay, other, you know, this is a bit embarrassing. Yeah. I says, when I was much younger, at the bottom slide, we may as well not skip over these. Um, yeah, so this is in Japan. They've got these lovely hot baths, natural uh, pools, and we came across one of these on a skiing trip, so we decided to jump in, which was a brilliant idea, until we actually got out, and it was about, <laughs> uh, it was about minus 15 with a quite a strong wind, hence the uh, headpiece on. And yeah, getting out was extremely dangerous because effectively when we stood up, the water froze. And we had to get changed, get on our skis and get down to the, like, the next lodge, whatever, it was about half an hour away before we actually just died. Um, we just, just about made it. And then the top one is, some, is another extreme environment, that's uh, going caves. And you don't find bees in any of these, or any wasps, so it's completely irrelevant. And you don't find any bees or wasps down here. 
But uh, this is where I used to spend a lot of time uh, you know, doing underwater photography. I used to live on a small island. And uh, yeah, we used to go out and play cricket underwater with huge mussels and go and find Nemo, mess around. And then I did spend a small chunk of my career earning money. And uh, I decided not to go down to the local Asda supermarket, but I went to the Falkland Islands and worked as a fisheries officer for half a year. And uh, this is just working on the fishing boats. So this is what fishing used to be like in my day before they fished everything out. And these were just huge amounts of 70 tons of uh, red snapper in that net. Th that's far too much. There's, that causes lots of problems. They, they don't want to catch that much. It was just by accident, uh, genuinely. And uh, it, it breaks equipment. It's far too heavy to get up on deck. It took them hours to get that up. And then the other one's a squid. And uh, squid fisheries, uh, it's a big thing down there. And uh, they're attracted by light, like moths. Um, and then, OK, so we're getting closer now. So we're getting on to insects. Uh, these are tiger beetles. These live in the UK. Um, and one thing I've been working, as I say, I've been out in Brazil. And one of the things that's amazing there, that most of the ants that we we're looking at as well as, as bees, they're actually really small. Um, and they're so small, you just collect a few and think, yeah, yeah, another boring small ant. But then when you get it back and stick it under the microscope, oh, my God, you want to see what they're, they're, you know, they're absolutely horrific. A lot of them look like this, with huge spines, huge teeth. And it's basically just a sort of like a small a mini world. Right, finally, we're on to bees. We'll get onto the hornets eventually. So these are bees. These are African bees, not Africanized bees, but these are the African bees. And you can see here this guy, he's not wearing his gloves. This is in the Kruger National Park. The guy behind him in the bee suit has got a high powered rifle. <laughs> and if you notice, his job is to protect us from the wildlife because you're not allowed out. If anybody's been lucky enough to go to the Kruger Park, if you ever get a chance, then put it on your list. It is like one of the best places in the world to see wildlife. But you're not allowed outside your vehicles. I mean, you can't just go wandering off because basically you become part of the food chain. And uh, people get killed every year there. They think, oh, look at that nice little lion. Wander off. And the uh, sleeping lion, actually, that's the, not the problem. It's the one behind you you haven't seen. And basically, you don't see. And uh, so you have to stay. So we were very, very privileged to be allowed out. And actually, there was a bee project that we were involved in. And uh, we were going looking at, um, at the bee colonies. And so once you get out of the vehicle, this guy was there to basically uh, protect us. And the bees there were very quiet, um, as you can see. Um, one of the problems in the park is that they, they nest in ironwood trees, so you can't really do any, any biology on them. So they put trap boxes up all around the park, and then we could see whether... We were actually looking for varroa, whether varroa was, was, was going through the um, park. They were very frightened of the, of the native bees being wiped out in the Kruger National Park. So, uh, and they were great. Now, I haven't got the pictures that we've just had from the Africanized bee experience in Brazil, but it definitely wasn't like that. Uh, we spend quite a lot of time taping our gloves up with, like, sellotape. And then they're, they're same round in their feet. And they don't have sherry for our bee suits. They're just useless there. They have things with, like, huge screens around the front. And uh, unfortunately, I've got this cracking photograph of, of the smokers there. But their smokers are, I am not kidding, this size. They are absolutely huge, and they cannot understand how we, we use small smokers in the UK. They are massive, um, and they need to be constantly smoked. And if they're looked after very well, they can be all right. But occasionally, if they get out of control, yeah, okay, you can't see much out of your veil, and they can be pretty frightening. We had a couple, we went to sample some bees that have been abandoned, basically. They hadn't been gone through for a long time. And yeah, that was a, a, a genuine, ex, uh, unpleasant experience. So the Africanized bees can be bad, but um, they can also be very good. So getting a bit closer. So the honeybees are social, as in they live in a group. And beekeepers, because we're so used to that concept, 
we're well aware of it. But 99% of all insects are not social, they're actually solitary. So th these uh, group of uh, helictid bees, actually, they're all solitary bees, but they get together at night. So they basically fly out and forage in the daytime, and at night they all come together, they aggregate. And they aggregate for safety, the safety in numbers. Um, and that's a long been held, one of the uh, reasons for the evolution of societies, evolution of sociality in insects, is that you're actually safer as a group than as individuals. And there was, uh, I was very fortunate to hear a fantastic talk very recently about some work where they were looking at this idea that it's the group that protects you and it tends to be the outliers, the slow ones and the ones on the edges of the group are the ones that are always predated. And as long as you can cycle and stay within that group, then you reduce the time that you're sort of uh, at risk. But it's been tested hundreds of times, but never very well because you can't control for all factors because it's usually smaller ones on the outside of, the, uh, of a big group. It's the slower ones, it's the sicker ones. And so what they wanted to test was, it was a, a natural system where actually everything was controlled for and do, is it genuine that the predators will still go for the ones on the outside? And what they've done, um, it was a PhD student that came up with it in South Africa and they were studying the seals and they get attacked by the great white sharks on one of these small islands. And he came up with this brilliant idea. And what they did, they cut out plastic seals from like a piece of plastic, black plastic, the size of a seal. And they cut out loads of them so they could have sort of 20 of these seals. And then they put them on a bamboo frame. So they just spaced them out so they could control the space of the seals in the frame, so the size of the group. And then they just towed this out behind the boat. So put it on a rope and they just basically towed it around the island. Well, fair enough, soon enough, in about sort of 10 minutes, one of the sharks would attack them because they, they look up, see the seal, see the group, choose which one they want to go for, shut their eyes, and then they just power up from deep and they attack from below. And basically what they do is that they think, oh, shit, it's a plastic seal, not having any of that. They drop it, and then they, the scientists bring everything in and they see which of the seals has been attacked on their plastic, on their grid. And then they record that down and then they fix it and then they do it again and again and again and again and they can change the size. Anyway, the long shot of it is, it is genuinely always the ones on the outside that they get attacked. So this was a nice example of actually finally proving that the, the purpose of a group is for actual safety. So that's what brought together, that was what the cause was for social insects to arise was safety in a group and then that's sort of evolved from that point onwards to this extreme situation where we have now and, and bees are fairly far to the to the um, sort of extremist of the extreme where you have one individual and tens of thousands of workers that don't actually uh, reproduce um, you've still got things like aceton ants which we can look at see in Brazil which have up to two million workers and one queen um, in their colony. They're right at the very far end of it. And then coming down towards the sort of lower end of it, it's where the hornets and the wasps um, sit because they have a single queen, just like the honeybees, um, but their colony size is actually a lot smaller. They're down between 10 and 20 workers and they can get up to a couple of thousand workers in temperate climates. Some species of, of wasps um, in the tropics can get up, 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 up to a few, well, yeah, maybe up to about 8,000. That that's really is about as, as big as you're going to get. So you're going to have, you have no wasp colony that's as big as a honeybee colony. Okay, so that's the first big difference is they're, they're, they're much smaller. And one of the reasons for that is their lifestyle. They, they, they've got a very, very different um, uh, life history, which is what we'll go through. Um, so the first big difference um, is that wasps, uh, uh, sorry, bees are from heaven. They're God's gift to man. They make honey. You know, everybody likes them. They're fluffy. Everybody walks around with 
you know, um, bags with, that are made of, not made of bees, look like bees, bumblebees, and uh, they're industrious and they're hardworking. Um, and when it comes to the wasps and hornets, it's completely the opposite. You'd never see somebody walking around with a, with a hornet on the back. Or if it is, it's, you know, it's something to do with ice hockey or some, you know, rough sport or, you know, these are dangerous. So they, and these are from the God, these are from the devil. And there really is a sort of psychic split in, in these two groups of insects. And a lot of that comes down to that the, the wasps and the hornets are all carnivorous. So that's their big life history trait, which is very different to our vegetarian honeybees. So all the bees are vegetarian, all the wasps are carnivorous. And hence, they do very different jobs. So they don't do a massive amount of pollination. Um, they're sort of at the next level. They do a huge amount of pest control. They're the ones that basically will reduce the amount of pests. And if we don't have them, we'd still be in big trouble. And the other huge difference is because they're carnivorous, it is very, very difficult to live through um, winter periods in a temperate climate because there's no food. I mean, we asked the students, what happens if, you know, I shut down all the Tesco's and Sainsbury's and Morrison's and Asda and corner shops for six months during the winter? I and mean, what would you do? And the thing is, is most of the students, oh, go to sleep. <laughs> and, and the answer is, yes, you go to sleep because the silly buggers that get on their bikes and go cycling and doing other stuff, they're going to die out really fast because they're going to be burning more energy. So what you do is you go to sleep. You conserve what you've got to get through that period till the shops open again in the spring and then you start foraging. Um, bees, as you all know, have, have got a very clever trick and they basically store all the honey up as long as you lot don't nick it. And show it here when you give them some back at the beginning of the winter time so you feed the, you know, your syrup back as you all know is that they've got a different method so they basically can survive the winter period by storing that honey up and that gets them through but meat is very very difficult to store over the winter time so they basically don't they just hibernate so that's the really big difference and that explains a huge amount of the biology so the first thing we'll start the cycle with a queen. So this is a queen. This is a giant hornet of Japan. This is the thing that will be called the Asian hornet of, you know, that's coming in France and da 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 da. And it isn't. Okay, so this is restricted to, to, to Japan and China. It is extremely large. Um, and the queen is probably the, one of the largest social insects um, on the planet. And it is a, a mighty beast. And they say from, you know, small beginnings, great things grow. And it's exactly the same with the hornets. So what they do at the beginning of the year, around about April time, then they emerge from hibernation when the spring warms up and they go out and find some food. And usually tree sap, um, that's around the earliest of the, that's one of the early foods they can get hold of, a bit of nectar if they can, but it's often the, their, their natural food is tree sap at this time of the year. They're pretty low on reserves. And then they go out and scrape paper and they start to build a nest. And the nest is extremely small, size of a golf ball. And it's very, very rare you'll find it. I'm sure most of you at some point in your shed, you've seen a little tiny golf ball or tennis ball of paper inside your shed somewhere. And this will be one of our native wasps. So the wasps and the hornets, they all follow exactly the same lifestyle. And they build this very small nest with a few cells inside. Within them cells, they lay eggs and they rear the first workers. So initially, you see these very large wasps floating around in April and then they pretty much disappear. That's it. You pretty much don't see them again. Um, this is their out foraging, getting the food, feeding the larva, rearing the first set of brood up. And the nests you barely ever see. Uh, these can be down in the ground usually in enclosed spaces, and then they very slowly grow. And these are a couple of other species. And as soon as the first workers emerge, they then start to take all the other duties over. Going outside is actually pretty dangerous. Um, you know, and it's just the same for us. There is more people killed you know, going out and getting into car accidents 
than if you just sat at home watching the telly all the time. Your homes are very relatively safe, safe place compared to outdoors, and it's exactly the same for the wasps. They go out, they forage, they get killed. Well, there's a bigger chance of being killed. So the queens never go out. As soon as they've done the risky bit, got their first workers out, they stay indoors. Um, so again, it's a bit like the, uh, the, the honeybee queens. And they then just lay eggs. They just become egg laying machines. And they will never leave the nest ever again. That's it. That, they're stuck inside that. Then the workers do all the jobs. So they basically protect the nest. Um, they build a nest. They get the food. They rear it. They guard it. They excavate. They do all their other jobs, just in, in many ways like, like the honeybees do. Um, some of the interesting facts, though. The first few workers are very timid. They will not sting you. Um, they, they need really strong provocation for them to attack you. Because them first few workers are really valuable. Because if you kill one of them two workers, it has a big detrimental effect on the colony. So there's only two workers in the colony, just as the queen's uh, got the first brood out. You lose one of them workers. That's 50% of your workforce, workforce has disappeared. You lose one of them workers in a, a honeybee colony, it is 0.0001% of the workforce has disappeared. So the workers know this, so they are very, very shy and timid. And they only start to become more aggressive and defensive as the colony starts to grow. And even then, they're only being defensive. So they will only look after the colony if the, you know, it's been attacked. So basically, where you're hedge trimming a hedge with your hedge trimmer, and you're getting close to a colony, yeah, sure, they don't like it because they think that you've got to cut their colony in half. So they then will actually, the vibration, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll come out and protect the nest, just like bees do. Um, the only difference, again, another big difference between the two is that bees are u almost unique in the world that when they uh, sting, they, re they release, uh, the stinger stays with them and uh, they fly off and that keeps pumping. Uh, almost every other thing that stings you can withdraw the sting. They, they're not, they don't do this sort of sacrifice. Um, and, the, and the wasps are a, a, exactly the same. So you can be stung multiple times and they have a, quite a large venom sac so you can actually get stung several times. And this is one of the big problems when it gets into your beer and you're drinking it and basically you know, they get stung five times down their neck as it's been swallowed and you get a very bad reaction. So it, that's another of, of the big differences. And the other one, there is a large number as well. But apart from defensive, it's the same. Um, inside the nest, if you open the nests up, they're, uh, again, at 90 degrees to what you, what you think is in honeybees, is that all the combs are actually hanging down and they're all horizontal. And the white silk caps are the, uh, the pupil stage. So the caps are spun, just like in the bees, um, but it's, it's, uh, there's no wax involved at all. The whole thing is just a, a paper structure, and then they have a, an envelope on the outside. Just like bees, they thermoregulate. So um, when, when I did my first ever um, work and how I sort of got involved with these uh, critters was I was in Japan just wandering around, and I found a very large nest underneath the bridge. It was, you know, sort of this size, big paper thing. I was really impressed. And I thought, oh, it's okay. It's, you know, it was about zero degrees. It was in November. It was cold. And I thought, oh, wow. Oh, that's, I was going to see what, you know, what it is. And I managed to, uh, I sort of whacked it with a bit of stick. And I probably got stung <laughs> quite badly. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, they're cold-blooded, they're insects, it's freezing cold. How the dickens does that happen? So they went home, next, got a thermometer, came back the next day, and I, I went up in the night and I rammed the thermometer into the nest, ran away, got my binoculars <laughs> out, and then I watched the thermometer rise up to about 36 degrees. And then I thought, oh, let me neck. They're not cold-blooded, something's happening. And uh, so then I got a machine with five or six thermometers and put them in the nest and uh, saw that actually they were, had a constant nest temperature throughout the entire day and night. I then thought I was going to get a Nobel Prize because I discovered something absolutely amazing. Um, and then I started going through the literature and having a look and yeah, everybody knew about it. It was really old hat. 
Um, but not in this particular species. And uh, there was mainly none in bumblebees. And of course, you lot are known honeybees. Of course, you, you already knew all this. But I was naive at the time. And so we actually I spent, I then did a PhD on this, well, a master's on this, and actually did a lot of, looked at uh, a lot of information on thermoregulation in wasps and, and how they actually do it. Um, and how well it's controlled. And it is, it is almost as good as honeybees. But you've got to remember, there's not as many honeybees within a colony. So their uh, regulation is not quite as uh, perfect. And so, as I say, as, as the nest gets uh, larger, the, the colony grows. And then eventually, at some point, just like in the bees, they start to produce sexuals. And that was something that we were studying. We were looking at what's that, that switch. And it seems to be what's called the larva worker ratio. So when the um, amount of larva and the amount of uh, workers in the colony meet a, a certain ratio, and I can't remember exactly what it is, then there's a switch. And she starts to produce uh, sexuals. So these are the, the, the males, which are always produced first. And then she starts laying the, the queens, the new queens that are going to come out in the colony, which are in much larger cells. The other thing with the, with the, um, uh, the hornets, the colonies get bigger and bigger. The cells also get bigger and bigger with age. And hence the hornets and wasps get bigger and bigger. Um, not like your bees. All your bees are the same size. Uh, whether they're young or the old, if your colony's five, it, well, hang on. Yeah, if your colony's 10 years old, and you've never changed the combs, your bees get slightly smaller and smaller and smaller. But if you continually renew the wax, then the bees will stay the same size. It's not very efficient. So what the, what the hornets do, they start off producing small uh, workers, which are easy to produce. And then as the colony grows, the, the workers get bigger and bigger. And uh, eventually you end up with actually very big workers. And some of the, the larger workers are almost the same size as the queen. And then they just switch over to queen production. And the queens are different. They start to sequester uh, fats. Um, and so the males do as well. And what they do, they build up a fat body. And they get that from inside the colony. They don't go outside to get the food. So eventually at maturity, I'll talk a bit more about the, um, the nutrition in a minute. But at maturity, a colony can look like this. Um, this is Vespa simula, the, the, one of the yellow hornets in Japan, which is what I spent a lot of time working on. It's very similar to the hornets, which are now in uh, France coming through, about the same size of nest, almost the same biology. So everything I'm talking about here, about the hornet biology, is exactly the same as the Asian hornets. Um, this person is either very brave or very stupid. Um, actually, this is a live colony. This is not dead. At night, this is taken at night, and as long as it's very quiet and the light is somewhere else, he's fine. If he, if he touches that nest, they'll, they'll come out onto the outside and start having a look what's going on. But we, we keep a light shining in a different direction, and they're attracted to the light, not to him, basically. Um, but they're revered in Japan because of this phenomenal amount of work they put into making the nest. And each one of them tiny stripes you see is a tiny piece of wood they've gone off, scraped it, with, mixed it with the saliva, and then made it a nice thin piece of paper. Because they invented paper before we were born, basically. And if you were to open up one of these large nests, this is what you'd see inside. So these are all the combs removed. Now this is getting to the top end of um, the number of cells or the size of a hornet colony. But the Asian hornets. I get it, I will reach this sort of size in a good, a good season. This year will be very particularly good because we've had such a long uh, autumn. And you can see that the, the white sections are actually the, the pupae or all the pupil caps. And those that are at the front of very good eyesight you can see uh, towards the bottom sections, there's little bumps. So some look a bit higher than others. And the lower ones will be the males and the higher ones are the, are the queens. And what the, the system they use here is that they produce the workers. They stop producing workers. Then they produce males. Then they stop producing. Well, they don't stop. They taper off the males and increase queen production. So the queens are the last things they produce. So the longer the season, the more queens get produced effectively. So it's very, very important in hornet biology 
is how long the season is so this season is particularly good because one of these colonies can produce about a thousand queens so that's potentially a thousand new new um, colonies so this is a big difference from your honeybees which just make one or two splits a year if you're lucky these can escalate their populations hugely and that's why the Asian hornets been spreading so fast because nothing holding it back and their reproductive rate is absolutely not can be potentially phenomenally high especially uh, in good years like this if you cut um, the comb across this is what you'll see first of all it's the uh, paper that, that's constructing the comb if you see right at the top there the pedicule they call it that that's one of the struts it's got white bits in it and that's silk caps so they've taken the silk caps that the larvae have spun and they use it to reinforce the paper so it's basically like reinforced concrete and these are very strong and they support quite a, a, a weight at the end because they've got to support everything underneath it so it can be kilos of weight that these pieces of paper are struts are supporting and then this is the uh, larva developing into the uh, adult which is very similar to what happens in the bees the only big difference is because they're carnivorous they eat meat and with meat comes bones or in insect world that's exoskeleton the skin and they have to get rid of it so if you look at the top end of each of the larvae there's a little black dot and that's the, what's called the meconia and that's been excreted so when the larvae change into pupae they, they basically go to the toilet once they just excrete everything in this uh, in this big lump and then basically that's it and then they can then pupate they're clean um, and they go through the normal uh, developmental to they come out as an adult which is very much similar to what happens in, in, the, in the bee except for this meconia and the meconias we can then count I spent years doing this but basically you break the cells open and you can count the number of meconia that are in there because they never remove them so we can tell how many times a cell has been used because some species reuse cells so sometimes they've been used three times two times or one and for that I can get very accurate information of how many individuals have been produced by certain colonies so they're a really useful biological tool to actually um, find out what uh, how many hornets have been in that colony and I think nowadays you could actually use DNA techniques to take that and actually find out what they've been feeding on because you can actually all the DNA will be sat in there so um, so they, that's quite useful for, for hornet research which is a big difference again from from bees right I'm just going to go through a little bit of what everybody knows uh, and this will get into the papers and this is not what is going to happen to your bees okay I can guarantee it that this is not going to happen this is the giant hornet this is the, the giant hornet of, um, of Japan it's uh, Vesper mandrinia and Vesper mandarinia and that's not photoshopped okay that is real you know how big your bees are that's how big the hornet is okay it's huge and these are, Asia, these are um, European honeybees um, they have not evolved with this species and within a few years of us bringing European honeybees to Japan this species of hornet and only this species of hornet worked out that it could attack the colonies without any real problems um, and what happens is that the bees line up and attack it one at a time and it just basically cuts heads off and destroys the bees it's not interested in the bees at all it's interested in getting into the colony and this behavior of just lining up to attack is basically suicide for the bees but that's all they know what to do and in, in about two hours 30,000 bees are gone not one hornet does it but several hornets do it and I, unfortunately I say I, it's on the other computer but um, I when I was in Brazil somebody said oh the hornets have arrived what do I do and I'm like oh, panic panic what do you mean the hornets have arrived and obviously I wasn't in the UK so I, I you know cut off so I, I quickly checked the internet 
thought, oh, right, you know, where is it going to be? Oh, Daily Mirror, right, okay, they must be right. Let's see what they've got to say. <laughs> oh, run, runners in um, Downton Abbey, fun run in thing, gets attacked by a massive swarm of hornets. Oh, bloody that, this is really good stuff. These hornets can kill 40 bees a second. All right, okay, uh, let's have a look at the pictures. And they've got the picture of this tiny little native wasp. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, this is not, this doesn't seem to be right. And then on the next page, they've got a picture of them holding up a giant hornet, saying, you know, this is the Asian hornet from our picture files, you know, from France, and this kills 40 bees a minute. Uh, uh, 40 bees a second, or not 40 bees a minute, and this is what's attacked all the runners in Downton Abbey, and then there's this poor native little yellow, black Golica Vespula in the corner saying, you want the bees, you want the bees? <laughs> well, that big guy over there is really scary. And I don't know how they get away with it, I really don't. And then I found another one that I connected to another link, which was about two months prior to that, saying, here is the giant hornet, the, the Asian hornets have arrived, and uh, this is definite proof. And there's a big picture of uh, an individual solitary wood wasp, which is a solitary insect. This has got a needle up to six centimetres long. No, it hasn't got a stinger at all. It's just got some of the basically lay eggs in, 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 in the wood. And then they've got a quote, I was so scared, I squashed it with an hammer. You know. <laughs> So clearly the picture that there was in the p paper was not the picture. Or it, it, they took a picture, then squashed it with a hammer. I don't know. But I just don't know how the mirror can get away with this. It, because it's just, you know, it, it's completely wrong. And obviously they just don't take time. And it's misinformation. And the trouble is, is even really educated uh, beekeepers and, and general public, it, part of the stories are right. So this is where they're getting really confused and it's sending out the wrong message. And it really is, you know, it's, it's the responsibility of the media to get at least it partly right because there's going to be a huge decimation of our native hornets, native wasps by you know, not beekeepers who are educated and have got all the information just by the general public think they're saving the world by killing anything that looks remotely like, as you know, um, a hornet, and I wouldn't be surprised it's like you come back, Jesus, where's all my bee colonies gone? Oh, they're there with the Asian hornets. I saw them. They've got like this huge stinger. And yeah, no, they were in front of the colonies. They were attacking my bees. Oh, they're not living in the colonies. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, anyway. Uh, you go back to new colonies. So there's this huge amount of misinformation around, and they really are, uh, the, the newspapers are terrible. So and this is what they'll put on the front page. They've already done it several times, and they will continue to do it, and it's not. So this is completely unique to this hornet in Asia, and this hornet is not coming to the UK. It will never come here. Well, it could do, but it's not the one that's coming from France. And this is what it does. This is its, its skill. It annihilates the bees, goes in. It's not interested in a single bee. One, eat, one of them goes into the colony and then basically robs the colony out. And it will feed on all the larvae um, and, and some of, mainly the larvae, that's what they're after. And they will then guard that colony. I've seen this. They actually sit there at the front of the colony all night guarding it. And then their workers come back the following day and continue to plunder it till, till they've actually got rid of it. And these hornets actually prey on other hornets. So we could introduce them as a biopest control to try and kill the Asian hornets. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's a good idea. I'll... I'll ask, yeah, you know, maybe I should go to DEFRA and suggest that I bring this in to kill the other hornets. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. So that's a possibility. Now, the Asian hornets, um, actually, they don't get away with this normally because the Asian honeybees, and some of you have heard about this, they've got this beautiful trick that they've evolved. Um, and what they do, they don't attack one at a time. They jump on it in their hundreds very, very fast. Uh, and unfortunately, I haven't got access to the internet. But go home, look under YouTube, just put in Asian hornets, um, attacking bees, thermal defense. Uh, there's, there's loads of clips. And there's actually whole um, programs about it. 
and this is what you'll see. They suddenly swarm onto the hornet very, very fast. Now, they can't kill it by stinging. It's just impossible. They're, it's just too thick, their cuticle. So what they do, they actually cook it to death, and they heat it up, and this is a beautiful picture. This is known about for a long time, but until we got the thermal imaging cameras, nobody sort of believed it. And that's the, th the thermal imaging camera, and the whiter it is, the hotter it is. And what they do is they heat the hornet to death. And the bees can tolerate a couple more degrees, up to about 47, I think it is. Well, the hornet's about 45, is that enough? And they, they just kill it. If they kill that scout, the one that was looking for the nest before it goes back and gets its mates, it, that's it. Their, their nest location remains secret, so they're fine. And that's what they'll be trying to do with any other species of hornet that come too close. So this is where the Asian hornet has a sort of comes in very nicely because the Asian hornets have learnt this and they never ever land on a colony. They always hover outside the colonies and catch the bees. So they can never be bald. So it's, you know, all of these evolution, it's an arms race. You know, the hornets attack the bees. Oh, the bees are sick of this. And eventually they get a mechanism which then they can kill the hornets, hey, the bees are winning for a bit, and then the hornets go, oh, I'm not going anywhere near there, I'll start doing a different tactic. And so the Asian hornets are using this different tactic of actually hovering in front of the colonies and collect the incoming bees. So that's this, this, this beautiful example. And I say, our European bees just don't do this. It would be useless against the Asian hornet anyway because they've learned to actually <coughs> a, a, avoid it. So the only natural predator of, of hornets is um, there's honey buzzards, try and introduce them, but no, nah, probably won't work, uh, and people. And uh, unfortunately, hornets kill people, so unless you're highly specialised, uh, you don't go and collect them. And the honey buzzards only, ex only get weak colonies, colonies which are collapsing, they've got disease, um, or they've been attacked by other hornets, actually. And they've also got strength and feathers, so they don't get stung when they're attacking them, and they're actually very rare. And uh, so in Japan, where I worked for uh, many years, in the mountains, the, the, there's a small number of highly specialized people actually collect them. You'll often see the nests. Uh, what they'll do is they'll collect the nests after, at the end of the winter when there's been some very hard frost for a long period of time, so there's nothing left in them. They'll cut them down. They hang them in temples, put prayers on them, because they're seen as very industrious. And they sometimes put them in the entrance halls of houses. Um, because they're, they're really beautiful. They're works of art, effectively. Right. And it's, you know, it's no different to the National Honey Show. You've got bits of comb you know, out uh, being displayed, and the, you know, the general public will go, what the heck, look at that, what's that bit of, yeah, a bit of wax, geez. Um, and here we'll go, ooh, isn't that beautiful? You know? So it's the same thing in Japan. And so this is the guy I used to work with for, for a long time. Um, he was uh, one of the farmers who, who was a specialist in collection, collecting the hornet um, uh, colonies. And we basically ended up as a sort of um, uh, a marriage of convenience, or I'm not quite sure how to explain it. But basically, he wants the hornet colonies. Um, he doesn't want to collect them until they're mature. I'm interested in actually looking at them and studying them. So I spend a lot of time locating the nests. And then basically we put a sign on it saying this was for scientific research, please not do not remove because there's other people looking for the colonies. And then what would happen is that when they were mature, we'd collect them. I'd spend all night recording everything, all the details I needed for my population study, and then the next day we'd eat them. <laughs> so I had to get things done pretty quick. And so basically here he is uh, the next day removing all the larvae. These are highly prized. In, in Asian culture, very, very expensive. And you end up with lovely plates of hornet grub. I mean, there's hundreds of pounds worth there, but we wouldn't sell them. The, the farmers won't sell them. They actually exchange them for mushrooms, which are about as expensive. Matsutake, uh, uh, matsutake mushrooms, about 30 quid, 30 to 50 quid a mushroom, depending on how good it is. Um, and then we have these big parties and yeah, very different, and it comes in lots of different forms. They fry the adults, dis like 
crispy fried, a bit, a bit of salt on them, and then they actually uh, pickle them, and you have them all during the winter time, because in the mountains, there is not a lot of protein in, in these areas. There's a little bit of fish, but these are uh, some that they can use all winter and store. But there's one more important thing which explains a huge amount about the biology um, of, of the hornets and things that goes into traps and what have you, is that hornets, like bees, have got an incredibly narrow waist, and that narrow waist allows them to sting things to basically protect themselves. But if you've got a very narrow waist, if you're a vegetarian living on a liquid diet, it's not a problem because liquid goes through very small gaps. But if you're, if you're a, a carnivore, you can't eat meat because you effectively can't digest it. So there's a real problem because basically the, 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 the stomach, it, as you all know, is in the, the back end in the abdomen and you've got to get the food there to digest it. And if you can't get it there past the constriction, then you're in trouble. So the, the, the hornets and wasps have come with a really clever uh, solution to this. And what they do is they go out, they collect the food, they steal it off spiders or take the local caterpillars, they chew it up in the field, they get some nourishment from chewing it, they make a meatball, and then they fly directly back with the meatball to their nest. And when they get back to the nest, they then feed the meatball to their larvae, and that's what's in that four picture, those lumps of steak that we're giving them the, to the larvae. Now, larvae are just simply large tubes with a pair of teeth on the top. They don't have any constrictions and they just eat the meat. But what they, has sort of recently been found, or not that recent now, is that the larvae, if you can see here, they produce a huge droplet of liquid. And that liquid is full of energy. And then the, the adults drink it, and that's where they get nearly all their nutrition from. It's full of, of sugars and proteins and so that larval juice is effectively what they what they use and this explains a huge amount because when them larvae disappear at the end of the season there's no food no sugary foods for the wasps and that's when they come into contact with us because you suddenly have no wasps and then come September when you're out and it's lovely and sunny and you've got your picnics and they're everywhere and what it is is that their food's dried up and it dries up very quickly in the colony and the reason for it is if, if you remember back um, I mentioned that they switch to um, sexual production so you've got males and the queens and the queens are very large and they have to put on almost double their body weight um, with fat so they can hibernate over the winter because what they'll do is that once they leave the colony they will mate and then hibernate, that's it. And it's all done in a very short period of time, probably a day, we know very little about mating. So what they have to do is they have to fatten up. And the only food resource in the colony is this, this liquid. So there's now competition. So the workers are bringing in the food to feed the larvae. They're then taking the liquid to generate enough energy to go out and, and get more food. But then the queens, which are increasing in number all the time, are actually feeding on their sister queen larvae to get more food and you get to a point where the larvae the, the final set of larvae never develop they just get to this stage and they stay at that level because they can't get enough energy to pupate because it's always been sucked out of them they're always actually producing more food and more food they're almost like cows in this respect well their sisters fatten up and then basically then they'll go away and mate and then when that happens pretty much the colony collapses and it happens very quickly it's within a sort of a few weeks so a lot of colonies if you have a look at them inside there'd be a lot of dead larvae shriveled up and these are these last few or it could be last hundreds in some cases and then these are the uh, workers well then they can live for several weeks as long as they can find food outside the colony and that's where they're, you're, they're in your beer you're in your jam sandwiches they're in your house and it looks like there's a boom in wasps and there isn't it's just that they've switched food from going out collecting pests to going out collecting sugar because they're now in a survival mode and basically their colony's dead they've no chance of survival 
and it makes no difference what you do to them. The next generation has been secured, basically. Um, so again, this is why in the, uh, the, a lot of the hornet traps they're suggesting, they're just not going to work because simply they're going for the wrong food. In the summer, they're after meat. They're not after sweet stuff. They get enough of that from their colonies. And it explains a lot about the biology. You know, when they come into contact with us is when their colonies collapse. And believe it or not, different species have got different sizes of colonies. And so the tree wasps have very small colonies. And in sort of July, that's when their colonies die. And that's when they start becoming a nuisance. And some of the, the larger ones that live under the ground they actually uh, come out later in the year, sort of September, October time. So depending on which species are having a good year, and which species are having a bad year, uh, it'll all depend when we get encountered with them. And every year the newspapers calculate me, are we going to have a wasp year? And I'm like, I have no flipping idea. Um, let's wait and see. And they're desperate to get a wasp year. And in general, they happen about once every seven years because there's a, a, a two-year cycle roughly, so you get a lot of wasps, then less wasps, and then the next year you get more wasps, and then they drop down, and the next year you get more. And eventually you get a very, very big year, and then the whole thing collapses down and starts again, roughly about every seven years. Um, that's very long-term science. And just to finish on, some very initiative people in Japan took this juice, this hornet juice, and made it into a sports drink. <laughs> And, um, and this sports drink actually uh, is it's synthesized. Now, my son tried to use it for his, um, his final year at Loughborough for his project. And his supervisor said, oh, you're not going to kill any of my students by giving them that and seeing what happens to them. And he says, no, it's real, it's real stuff. And he says, well, yeah, OK, how do they milk all the hornet larvae? And he says, Ugh. So they synthesize it. So what they've done, they've taken out the, the amino acids from it and they've basically um, recreated exactly the same mix. The reason it's not in America and it's not here in the UK is that there is one particular amino acid which is essential for life, but in large quantities when they fed it in bucket loads to mice causes cancer, just like sugar causes cancer. So effectively it's banned. So we, they can't get a license to, to, to do it in this country. But it, this drink is massive in Japan. It is run by Meiji, which is as big as Coca-Cola over there. You can buy it in every drugstore. As, first of all, it was an energy drink, uh, as a sports drink. Now it's a diet drink with exercise because it burns more fat, supposedly. Um, but the winner of the, one of the Olympics was a Japanese lady, and she used this for training. So it, it, it's, it's difficult to know whether it, works or not but they make a lot of money out of it and the guy invented he gets whatever it is one p for every you know 10 pounds worth of this stuff made but um it's more just transitional taking something from biology and and you know and patenting it and it, it's great uh, it tastes flipping horrible <laughs> uh, it really is not pleasant so they put grapefruit in it to make it actually taste uh, half decent so I, but that's great for the public because if it tastes bad it must be a medicine which is going to do you good <laughs> so um, so right so I've gone through the whole talk without a single reference uh, a single picture of the Asian on it um, there's a good reason for that that's buried in my computer somewhere but the beauty is is that everything I've talked about here refers to the Asian hornet. They're exactly the same as the species we've been talking about and the hornets that are our, our native wasps. And they're actually really important. That Without them, we'd be knee-deep in aphids, pests, and bugs. Um, and they're just as important as bees. They, okay, they don't pollinate the flowers, but uh, if, you, if the flower's pollinated and then it gets eaten by aphids or caterpillars and what have you, then that's also a problem. So that's where the wasps come in. Effectively, they're, they're pest control officers. And they do most of their work, you know, unseen, in the background, to just get on with it. Um, and it's just this unfortunate behavior that when their nests are finished, if they just gracefully die, they would have a very good sort of reputation, but they don't. They tend to come and hassle us lot for a bit. Um, and 
they are actually very large and this is the problem that we're going to encounter with the asian hornet is that the the numbers can be so great that you don't have to die on phylactic shock they can put enough venom in a in a human to just overload their kidneys and just basically give just to kill them to give them toxic overload it's very unfortunate and it has happened i think four four or five times in france now with the asian hornet i'm surprised it hasn't happened more which is good news because they're terrified uh, in asia i think in the figures in japan is about 70 people a year thought to be killed by hornets mainly young people children who are playing and accidentally run into a nest and very old people who are just a bit more susceptible um, but they are incredibly common there they are very very common they're absolutely everywhere the houses in the mountain pretty much every third house in the mountain has one of these hornet nests on them um, and it's, they're just you know that's the very uh, sort of rural environment lots of food for them and they do very very well and even down in places like Malaysia we've got different species there and some species have moved in and do very well living on our waste basically all our hamburgers and stuff that we leave kicking around right so I don't know how long I've been going long probably far too long um, I'll finish there and I'll take any questions would there be any sort of uh, meat substitute that could be used uh, to tempt the Asian hornet um, into a trap in this country? I think the, um, the French are working on this idea of trying to use a, some sort of meat um, bait. But the hornets are pretty clever. They, they don't tend to go for dead stuff. So they'll, 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 they'll go preferentially to um, you know, whatever's around li you know, live live insects effectively um, so they're trying to look for for various attractants but work that's been done so far is not been that successful and the problem is with with all these traps you're only trapping at a, sh a few individuals from a very large population um, and that's the problem they're producing more hornets than you're often trapping because they tend to spread over a very very wide area so they could be all over the place. Um, what you really need to be able to do is, is, to, is to trap and kill the queens if you can when they're coming out from hibernation, which is what they try to do in New Zealand. And they actually paid people to collect the, wheat, the, the queens over winter because the logic goes, you kill one queen, you kill an entire colony, which is a great idea. So they paid, I don't know, it was 20 bucks for each queen and boy, the kids had a great year because they found hundreds of these things and they collected them from all over the place and they got a lot of money and the next year there was the biggest explosion in wasps in their history <laughs> um, and the reason that we know that we've explained this now is that once the populations become established and this will be a long long time in the UK but this will be happening in our native uh, setup is that there's a lot of competition for nest sites and so there's a lot of infighting between the queens so effectively the queens self-control each other and when we were studying this in japan we had 14 queens were killed at one nest so if if, if the nest gets destroyed by accident through farming or somebody knocks it over and remember the queen nests are really small then the queen rather than set a new colony up she just goes and finds another one and then tries to fight the resident queen and take it over called usurpation and that happens but when it happens a lot they, everything basically ends up getting injured so when they took all that competition out then all the wasps survived and all the populations shot up so it's a really complicated dynamic but yeah, it's a very very good idea and they are working on it and hopefully they'll get something are the hornets territorial in terms of uh, similar to wasps if you put up a, uh, an object that looks like a, a wasps nest um, you get fewer wasps nesting close to that object. Can you do that with hornets? Yeah, th this is interesting. I don't, I really don't know whether that's actually been shown. I know it's, uh, they sell these false wasp nests. And I don't know if there's what scientific basis this is on. And as far as I can see, from my experience on, 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 on hornets, but the wasps would be the same, that uh, it, it actually is completely rubbish. Um, so what happens is in the hornets we, we tend to get um, nests 
which can be very, very close apart. And especially the, uh, the, a lot of the, the Japanese farmers who keep these things, they could have 10 colonies around their one, look, one house because they bring them in from the wild and they stick them all over the house and feed them. And they don't seem to be, they don't fight among each other. Um, so normally they just seem to be distributed <laughs> where, where they can find nest sites. It's nest site availability. And, um, you know, if you've got a very good site, there's no reason why you can't have two wasp nests in one location. Um, and I don't think the wasps will, will go in and look at an old nest and think, well, I'm not going to nest here, because they never, they never reuse nests, but they do reuse nest sites. So often we would go into an attic and there might be seven or eight old nests there. In fact, we've got a beautiful picture of an old nest with a new one built underneath it. They've actually built onto the bottom of it. Um, so they will reuse nest sites. So I, I think that idea is, is just somebody's dreamed it up based on some possible pseudoscience. Um, but it's from my ex personal experience on, on the hornets and the distribution of wasps, I don't think it'll work. I mean, they, re they reuse sites all the time, so and it would just represent an old nest. Uh, yes, I was interested to know whether the, the level of predation on the Asian, that's the Vespa volant Volutina, I think Volutina. it's called. Volutina, um, yeah. is, is that as heavy? But uh, as the as the giant hornet, it's just that over, say over a longer period of time. You say that the Asian hornet uh, flies around the front of the nest, but is it killing as many bees as yeah. as it would do as the Asian would do in a couple of hours? Yeah, right. It's a really good question. That so in Japan, when we've looked at this, um, it's a pretty specialized job um, and what seems to be happening is that the uh, Asian hornets, I get this right, Asian bees, Aethys serrana, have got a warning system. So as soon as a hornet arrives and starts to hawk or hunt these in front of the colony, they all rush out into the colony and they start waving. They do this Mexican wave. It's amazing to see. If you just put it into YouTube, you'll see it. And they rustle, and you can hear it. And often, actually, it's a way that when we're walking through the forest, we go, hang on, ooh, ooh, there must be a colony close by, and you can hear it. It's actually audible. And what they do, they, they basically do this Mexican wave on front of the colony. And what it's telling the incoming workers is there's a hornet in the area because they can see it. It's just in front of them. And then the incoming workers will not come back the same way, effectively. So they will then approach their colony in a different direction. So and it's, 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 it's the same thing as you, you know. Basically, if you're going to, uh, you know, if you walk back every single day and somebody's going to mug you, they're just going to wait for you on the corner. Oh, he'll, nine o'clock, he'll be in a minute, just come around the corner, <laughs> get ready. But if your wife says, oh, there are them bad little lads are outside the house, you go, well, hang on, I'll come through the back. And you go around the back way. And that's exactly what they do with the bees. So rather than come back straight into the colony, they come back round the back. And so it's very difficult for the hornets because they're coming from all over the place to catch them. And so the success rate is pretty low. It appears to be very low. So there's only certain, ho certain individuals within the colony that can do it. And what we think is that they just come back. You know, one will take one individual bee, fly back to the colony, maybe come back and get another one. So predation rates are incredibly low in natural environments. Now, so that's why I didn't think it'd be a big problem, but the situation that's happened in France, and they've supported this by some really nice experiments, is that the European bees, there's no wavy-wavy, they just get on with their work. Hey, look at that big thing outside, doesn't matter, ignore it, get out. And so we c they're coming back in exactly the same direction every single time. <coughs> and so on their flight paths. And so the hornets, they're going, this is really easy. They're, all, they're not changing their directions. There's no alert system. So now you're getting several hornets stacking up, realizing that actually you don't need to be specialized to do this. Any daft hornet can get bees because you can see them. I mean, it's a really good example of how they do this is that footballers, um, like, it was actually, the experiments were done on ice hockey people. And what they did 
is they had the goalie who's got amazing reactions and then they had somebody stood sort of you know at the penalty mark with their puck and they basically tried to you know whack it into the goal and this puck's going at you know 70 80 90 miles an hour incredible speed and it's impossible for the goalie to see where that puck's going but what it does is it can calculate with his brain from the diary from the you know with the way he hits it to to estimate where it's going to go and try and save it and what they did is they simply put a paper screen in front of the hitter so he was doing it from exactly the same distance exactly so everything except the goalie couldn't see the puck until it came through this paper screen. And he couldn't save it at all because he couldn't work it out. And this is almost certainly what the, what the hornets are doing, is that they're spotting these bees at some distance and they can just calculate where they're going to come to and intercept them. And it's that long distance spotting that's important. So basically, but if they're coming out, oh God, there's one over here, right? Well, there's no one coming over from here. This is what the Asian bees do. But ours are just like, oh, hey, there's one, Fred's coming here, get him, got him, right. And then they fly away, come back. And the evidence is that this is what's happening, it sounds a bit far-fetched, is that the proportion of uh, food that is making up the hornet diet in France is up to 60% of honeybees. And they've shown very nicely that the more urban the environment the more honeybees make up the food because there's less of the food kicking around for them to predate on. So actually, this is why the beekeepers in France are having a problem with them because they're just easy pickings. So it's not the big dramatic thing like the, the, the giant hornets that will just wipe out your entire colony, but there seems to be quite a, you know, a reasonable drain. And it'll all depend on how close these colonies are to your, to your apiary, um, how big the colonies are, you know, and th they'll do it. It's not going to be a massive, you're not going to lose all your colonies. And to be honest, you're going to have so much warning that I think everybody in this audience probably won't really, you'd be very unlucky if you have to deal with the Asian hornet in any way or ha having any detrimental impact because DEFRA will try and eradicate or try and keep the numbers down and they will not build up the densities that will that have a big effect um, like they are having in, in, in France, uh, not, for, not for many years, I would suspect, you know, maybe another 10 years after it gets here. Uh, I understood that the uh, hornets will catch the bees who are going home, but uh, uh, is it the only way how, how they hunt, or are there all, also Velutina workers uh, patrolling along flowers and things like that? You see, in Asia, we, we, we see a lot of specialization. Some species will do this goalkeeping thing, and others will patrol on flowers. What is Velotuna uh, doing in France? I, I, well, you probably know more than me on, on the, uh, no, what, what these other ones are doing. Um, I, I don't know. Um, what's been reported in France is, is the hawking, and I think that's because people see it. But I think, you're, I think you're dead right, is that there will be some clipping and, and there will be predating wherever they can get. But I, I think that's less of a concern for beekeepers because you don't see it. Yes. <laughs> so the thing is, is if, if you lose all your bees when they're out foraging, you, you, you're not going to worry about it because you don't see it happening. It's, but you see one hornet in front of your colony, and oh my God, that's what's killing my colony. <laughs> Even the fact that it's swarming with varroa and everything's keeling over with the semen in the colony, that's the cause. But um, yeah, you, you're dead right. It's, you know, the, these are opportunities. They will take anything. If it's sitting on a flower, you know, taking some aphids, and a, and a honeybee comes and sits down next to it, it's like, oh, well, that's easy pickings, mate, and it's going to have that one. So they, yeah, you're dead right. They, they will predate other things elsewhere. But they can guarantee the reason that they, 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 this Hawkins sort of evolved is that it's very clever because it's a guaranteed food source. They can come back all the time. They don't have to go foraging, looking for you know, where the caterpillars are. And this is where hornets and wasps are very lazy in that respect. And well, they're not lazy, they're just very clever. Is if they find a, a patch of cabbages that's full of caterpillars, They'll just come back every day till they've gone because they know where the food is. There's not much commute. Well, they don't, we don't think there's much communication, 
We think that they lay trails now. They can actually lay trails for certain food sources. Um, but they go, they'll visit spiders' webs. Oh, why catch food if a spider does it for you? So they are often seen picking out spiders' um, prey in the mornings because the beauty of these hornets, again, is that they thermoregulate. So they're out, crack of dawn, where everything's really dozy. All the other insects are waking up. Mr. Spider's still asleep. He can hardly move. He's sitting there you know, in his web going, oh my God, it's going to be nicked. But he's not warm enough to go and get it yet. So the thing is that they can steal stuff. And often you'll see your wasp stealing from spider's webs uh, because it's just it's easy pickings. So whatever's around. Um, but this, the, the, the worrying fact is, is from the, the French thing, is a huge proportion is made up of honeybees. And that's why I think it's having a much bigger impact than I thought it would have. I was like, well, what are the beekeepers worried about? They'll take one or two, but it's so rare. But actually, no, they're, they're finding it seems to be quite a lot that they've been able to um, predate. At the end of the answer to the previous question, you said that DEFRA were going to step in and start doing stuff. What steps can DEFRA actually take? How are they going to Well, they have a... Any, uh, like any, a, a plan, uh, which, is, which, you know, they have done consultation and they've had a trial run as far as I'm aware. And so, you know, I'll give them the due that they are being proactive in this. And I, I think, I mean, I'm not, I can't speak for DEFRA, but from the, the, um, the way I think they've got this running is they've got, already they've got a very good reporting system. So basically, people who find stuff, they send pictures in and report it to either the, the bee unit or to the invasive disease. And they have been getting a lot of reports. Unfortunately, the newspapers have been getting one or two of these and yeah, you see what happens. And most of them have been false. And they've got some uh, sort of people looking out at certain places. They've been very good at producing information for the beekeepers and hopefully every beekeeper in this room knows what you're looking for and you know what's right and what's wrong. Um, when it actually comes here, this is going to be interesting. Uh, so what th uh, I think their general intention to do is to try and eradicate it. And that would be my advice. Give it a go. You've got to give it a go. It's oh, it's going to come and there's nothing they can do about it. But if they can isolate, if they can find the first nest and it's a single invasion, a single colony, and they can get it before it starts to reproduce, produce all the offspring, then that's it, it's nipped in the bud. Find the nest and just collect it. My advice is don't destroy it, it's just collect it and then basically find out what's going on because you get some really good information from the nest. It's already produced sexuals, then they're going to have to expand their area out sort of 30 kilometres and check and try to find more and, and have some sort of eradication programme. They're very realistic and as soon as the eradication programme they realise it's just it's a waste of time. Very quickly, it'll get out of hand, a bit like the Ebola. So I've been watching the, the Ebola outbreak since it was about 200 cases, because as soon as it hit that, I could see there was something different in this. But nobody did anything at all until we had somebody in America died and somebody in, the, you know, in Europe came back with it. And somebody, oh, my God, and now it's too late. It's, it's, it's out and it's an horrific situation, and it's only going to get worse. Um, and this is exactly the same as the hornet. Once it's contained, you can contain it, it's very small, and that's what they're er trying to eradicate it. And there is a chance of doing that, because the window is very narrow from when we will see it, it's almost certainly a beekeeper will see it, because of his hawking behaviour, and then it's find the nest, which is not easy. If they find the nest in time, get rid of it. Once it's, it's out there, and they've switch off the eradication program because it's just not possible to do that. And that would probably happen quite, quite quickly. I think they'll just go into the usual uh, education setup. Um, and I suspect then it'll be pest control people will take over because my advice is, you know, you beekeepers, you might be approached in the future to remove these. Do not, okay? Your equipment that you have will not sustain you against the hornet, uh, when these hornets. Um, they can spray venom, you may get away with it, but it's killed four people, and some of them are firefighters who are, are, you know, who are properly equipped. When things go wrong, they go wrong really fast. You may be fully equipped, you know, removing the colony from a cherry picker 
everything's fantastic, and then suddenly the colony breaks, hits the ground, you've got 3,000 angry hornets, and you've got a whole bunch of on onlookers watching, including children. And then that's when things go, and it's, you've had it. So, you know, these are not the things that we have in this country. They're very small. These are very aggressive, so they have to be given due respect. So you just report it. So I think DEFRA, you know, as always, they have a really good plan. Let's just hope they put it into action when it arrives. Uh, I'm not quite clear how the j ordinary Japanese person, what their attitude is to the hornet. You've mentioned farmers collecting hornets' nests, <coughs> and they're very common. You've mentioned 70 deaths a year in Japan. Does the ordinary Japanese person call on a pest control service to eradicate the Japanese hornet, or do they have some kind of sacred... Hmm, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so they have a very strong respect for them. Yes. So basically, uh, these people, the far, the, these, uh, yeah, I'm maybe being a bit too general, the, the farmers who I work with, there are just one or two of them. So they are highly specialised. They've learnt techniques and skills. And so there's very, very few people will go up and collect the nests. So there's just these, these are very specialised people. Um, yeah, so they're given due deference, basically. Um, they don't tend to have a uh, sort of pest control <coughs> group come in uh, and destroy them, unless they're in a really uh, difficult situation. So say they were in a, a school ground. But often they'll just cordon it off because they'll know it won't come back the next year. And there is so many of them. I mean, they're pretty much uh, everywhere. And one of their big, it's not an issue, but they're... Uh, they're, they're Shinto and Buddhist, so their religion's Buddhism, and Buddhism really preaches not to kill things, because you might come back as a hornet, not a good, a, not a good idea if you've just killed one, and if you've killed one, you probably come back as one, so a bit of a circular logic. So they, they tend to um, sort of respect them, so really they, there isn't that big a problem, they don't, you know, get in pest people to, to destroy them. If they have to, then they'll basically get people in who are specialists, people from universities, uh, to, to just take it at night. Because you've got to take these things at night. And a very good example of what happened when you got the, the public, the general public, got, uh, came to head to head with a wasp year. And this was in China last year. Some of you may uh, be aware of this, but they've been building their cities and they've been encroaching into the forests, which is where a lot of the hornets live. And it happened to be a hornet year, and they moved into one of the, the big towns. Or what was it? It's like quite a big area in central China. And it killed 40, 42 people and put over 1,000 in hospital. Now, it got really messy because there was more than one species involved. And, and then it became anything that lived outside with a sting was classed as a hornet. Now, the main culprit was pretty much certainly the Vespa volutina because there was a lot of pictures of them collecting nests that were in trees. Um, the giant hornet was involved, but it never nests in trees, so it nests in the ground. So it, there's a lot less chance of being disturbed because obviously in the ground, you know, it's not something you tend to come into contact with just as much. And they were around, but they got the bulk of the blame. In fact, they were the, the sole ones. But actually, they're not that aggressive outside their nests. And uh, now there was an order from the Chinese government to eradicate them. Now, that would never happen in, 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 a, in a country like Japan. And it was basically people would see these nests appear in their porches, and they'd go, oh, flipping thing, and they'd just whack it one. And then, of course, they would get really you know, badly stoned. Because all the children grew up with, with hornets at school, they're always around the area. I mean, these things were buzzing around. They're huge. Then they have this respect. They don't go out with a tennis racket and try and hit it. You know, they know it's, they just leave them alone. So it's just education. And, you know, it's the same thing. The two live together very well. Same in Korea and uh, same in most of rural China. They'll just avoid them. Uh, and, st and give, them the, give them room. It's uh, like us. I mean, we have wasps, and they nest in our attics. Do we go and destroy them, get the pest officers in? Most of the time, not. You know, if it's right outside our entrance, we'll either use the back entrance or we'll try and get rid of it. But, um, and it's just the same. You know, the hornets are bigger. And these Asian hornets will nest very high up in trees. They nest way up. 
Um, actually, they'll nest in your house, but they're very small, and then they migrate to a tree. But small biological detail, but when they get very big, they're usually very high up, a long way from people. So the only people that should really come into contact with them are, are and in number near the nest, is people who are trying to collect them uh, or throw stones at them, which is not a good idea. <laughs> I come from Jersey. We don't have hornets on Jersey because there's just not enough forage for them. Um, is that going to be the same with the Asian hornet, do you think? Um, I tell my members not to worry, you see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the bad news is that, yeah, I think if it, if it gets across, yeah, well, it's, I haven't mean, thought about Jersey. There, there is enough forage for them. Because you've got bees, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I understood that they were more riverine. Uh, uh, we don't have any rivers. No, they'll they'll pretty much they can live anywhere. I mean, as long as it can get to fresh water, right. and you do have fresh water on the island. Occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> so they're they're very adaptable. I mean, this was the big mistake when they came to France. Is that when they arrived? I think when they were first found. They were identified, and somebody said, "Oh, these are from trop these live in the tropics, so they'll die out in the winter. We don't have to worry." Unfortunately, they never got to talk to uh, you know one of the the few wasp experts in the world who would have actually told them that these do live in the tropics, but they live in the mountains of the tropics where it's a temperate environment, and actually they'll do very well in in, in our type of climate because people forget that the tropics have snow. You know, I mean, when I was in working in Hawaii, I got snowed on because there's big mountains there and you go up, stuff that lives up there is adapted to an alpine environment. So these are very robust. This is why they've done very, very well in, in, in France and in Korea. Don't forget, they are, these, the Asian hornet's spreading through Korea as well. And Korea's already got a lot of hornets and it's outcompeting pretty much every hornet that's there. And what they've shown in, um, in Korea is that it's incredibly well adapted to urban environments. So it prefers urban rather than rural environments, uh, especially the big concrete jungles of some of the cities. It's pretty much the only hornet that can live there. So it's become very well adapted to live in, probably on our waste. So just, you know, we leave a lot of meat kicking around. So I suspect you're not safe. Um, so keep, yeah, keep, keep your eyes open for it because you're, you're as close, yeah, you'll, be the first, you'll <laughs> possibly be the first, but <laughs> the thing is, is that the traffic from, I don't know what the, the way these things basically move around is natural dispersal, but the other way is their long distance moved is being moved when the hibernating queens, so they will come in via, you know, that caravan that's been left out in the field in France for your holiday home or some pot plants, and uh, it's got a hibernating queen in it, you bring it back, you stick your caravan out in your, in your garden, and then in springtime, this thing emerges from the curtains and off it goes and starts. That's how it gets moved long distances. So it's, it, it's how much sort of movement of people and things, and I'm not sure how much is from Jersey to, uh, you're more likely to get sort of a natural, them getting blown across. Well, we get hornets every year come in. Queen hornets come in every year. Every right? year, so yeah. at some point. But they never, they never, they never get established. No. Um, so these will be the Vesper crab row um, queens that get it. A lot of the that get blown in are probably workers often in, in bad weather. Um, queens are, well, you know, they do disperse. And, but they need a lot of old trees. They tend to nest in nest boxes, old trees. These things will nest in the open. So... That's, in their, that's one of their big advantages is why they're adaptable. And the predictions are they will go right up into Scotland here. So food will be a very, eventually a limiting factor, but you know, I've been to Jersey, there's loads of food there. So I think they'll do very well if they come. So I would do the same thing. You know, it's worth trying to eradicate it to start with, but then once it gets established, you just have to do education and just learn to live with it like everything else. You know, I was here what, 15 years ago, telling you about Varroa, you're all, you know, the doom and gloom about Varroa, and there's more beekeepers now than there was 15 years ago. You're all living with it, nobody's, but you all complain about it, but, <laughs> you, you know, you, you just get on with it, and that's exactly the same with the hornet, so.
just give it a little bit more respect than Varro.